Halo, nama saya adalah Yohanis Lamere dan saya berasal dari Tanimbar, Maluku, Indonesia. Selamat datang di episode pertama Laut Kita dari Earth Optimism Televisi Program Smithsonian Institution di Washington DC. Hari ini kita akan bicara tentang topik yang sangat berarti dan dekat dengan saya, yaitu bagaimana kita bisa melindungi terumbu karang untuk masa depan yang sehat. Terumbu karang merupakan bagian yang sangat penting dan makhluk hidup yang paling beragam di ekosistem laut dan juga bagian yang sangat penting bagi manusia. Apakah kamu tahu bahwa satu perempat dari semua spesies di laut bergantung pada terumbu karang untuk makanan dan rumah untuk melindungi diri mereka? Seharusnya saya tahu ya. Tentu saja rumah kita Indonesia memiliki terumbu karang paling beragam di dunia. Saya bukan peneliti atau ahli terumbu karang, tetapi saya tahu bahwa terumbu karang saat ini terancam dan saya sangat semangat untuk melindungi terumbu karang kita dan terutama planet ini. Pada tahun 2018, saya dipilih oleh Kedutaan Besar Amerika Serikat untuk mengikuti salah satu program kepemimpinan pemuda Asia Tenggara bersama anak muda dan para inisiator dari negara-negara anggota ASEAN. Program ini membawa saya untuk menghabiskan lima minggu di Washington DC, California, dan Hawaii untuk mempelajari praktek pengelolaan sumber daya alam di Amerika Serikat. Dan saya sekarang sedang belajar program S2 dengan fokus inovasi dan keberlanjutan di American University. Saya percaya bahwa banyak sekali tantangan global yang harus kita selesaikan. Seperti salah satunya adalah melindungi terumbu karang kita. Oleh karena itu, kita membutuhkan para inovator-inovator muda. Dan apakah kalian salah satu inovator? Hari ini kita akan melihat bagaimana beberapa ilmuwan menemukan cara-cara baru untuk mempelajari hidup dari terumbu karang, mengkontrol kesehatan mereka, dan membantu mereka untuk menjadi lebih siap dengan perubahan iklim. Mari kita saksikan cerita peneliti Mary Hagedorn dan Kristen Marhaver. Coral are a fundamental ecosystem in our oceans. We really need to save them. They support one quarter of all marine life in the ocean. My name is Mary Hagedorn, and I work on coral conservation and preservation. We are here in beautiful Curacao to study coral reproduction. My name is Kristen Marhaver, and I study coral spawning and the methods to help baby corals survive their earliest life stages. Elkhorn corals are beautiful and they're like living works of art. They're one of the most important species in the Caribbean because of the structure and the shape they make. They protect shorelines from waves, they create habitat for fish to hide underneath, and they're also a powerful species because when they do break apart, they can attach back to the reef and make more colonies. Around the Caribbean, we've lost something like 98% of this coral species, and in Florida, it's even worse than that because we're finding that there aren't very many genetically distinct individuals. We have these organisms that are glued to the bottom, and yet they're affecting the oceans in some of the most important ways. Coral, first and foremost, is an animal. When it starts out, you have a fertilized egg or embryo, and then goes through development and becomes a swimming larvae. It stays as a swimming larvae for about four or five days, and then it goes through a metamorphosis, where it changes from something that's swimming to something that's settled. Eventually it forms a polyp, then that forms two polyps, and then it forms a colony. You have to be really creative in how you think about them in order to figure out what really matters for them. We've been applying human reproductive techniques, like freezing sperm, to coral, and it allows you to preserve those cells for a year or hundreds of years. We are going to thaw sperm that's been in our banks for over 10 years and use them on fresh Curacao eggs to create embryos that wouldn't occur normally in the wild. 
For this particular species of coral, there's a western population, genetically speaking, and then there's an eastern population, which is here in Curacao. It's the first time that assisted gene transfer will be used in coral. We're bringing individuals from Florida and Puerto Rico and Curacao, which are hundreds of miles apart, together, and we're going to be able to fertilize fresh eggs from Curacao with these different sperm samples. We don't know if these populations of corals will even be able to fertilize themselves. If it does work, if the corals do fertilize, then we have a whole new tool for coral restoration, which is the ability to bring different genotypes from one region to another. And that's what the goal is here, is to help diversify the population and to give us cues as to whether those newly made, newly created reproductive organisms are going to be better at adapting for the future. This species has bundles of eggs mixed with sperm and it holds them in its mouth. And then we know in the next 10 or 20 or 30 minutes that they're going to release them all at the same time. The eggs move away and the sperm has to swim and fertilize a nearby neighbor's eggs. And it all happens within 45 minutes. So it starts and then ends and it's over, it's amazing. This species does not have a really tight reproductive schedule. They will spawn either on or sometime after the full moon. We can narrow down the window when it will spawn to a few days and a couple of months. Within about an hour, hour and a half window, we need to go diving before it happens and make sure we don't miss it. And if nothing happens, we just have to keep diving until we're sure we covered the whole window. And if they don't spawn this week, we have to dive until night 14. And if they don't spawn that night, then we will dive next month and start it all over again. Tonight the full moon is going to rise and if the coral are going to spawn, they'll begin spawning right around 9 o'clock. Night three, anything could happen. Everybody's got their hunches and their, <laughs> their tarot cards out, but we really don't know if they will spawn tonight or not. You have this mix of calm and, and peacefulness that you're underwater, but also this adrenaline that anything could happen at any minute. And then when I see the dive team come in very slowly, my heart just sinks knowing that we're not going to have any samples to work with that night. We have all sorts of nets and contraptions that we use to collect the eggs once they're released from the colony. Then we have to get back to shore. That gets transported into the laboratory. We will remove the eggs from the sperm. We'll thaw the samples. Hopefully we'll get all excellent sperm samples. Whoa! <laughs> okay, one of these is a champion. It's an incredible champion. So. Then we'll begin adding sperm and if it all goes great, you actually get to relax for about an hour, <laughs> maybe. As the eggs go from one to two to four cells and start dividing and forming the larva. And finally, when they start to swim, we feel like, okay, we got them through the process. We'll put them into water bottles and we'll transport them to Miami 
and our partners Florida Aquarium and Moat Marine Lab will meet us there. We're going to babies! <laughs> and they'll begin the process of settling those larvae. This is it. Here's all of our coral babies. They're all doing fantastic. I was super scared when I first got these things that they were going to be so totally different that they wouldn't work out. But thankfully, I was wrong. They're extremely healthy. They're growing extremely rapidly. These look so incredibly beautiful. There are so many variables that you have to keep in mind, and you have to watch, and you have to tinker with. And it could have been that they would have never even crossed, which would have been the end of the, end of the story. But clearly, they did, and that's, that's exciting. Any one thing that you don't pay attention to can cause lots of death, and so I'm in awe. <laughs> we couldn't ask for a better result than what we're seeing right here. This is the largest wildlife population of cryopreserved animals in the world. I mean, except for humans, of course, and maybe cows. <laughs> but it's very rare that we make these kinds of populations with cryopreserved sperm and that we have the opportunity to do something that impacts wildlife. You can take even just a few examples of these polyps and turn them into something that is much larger. You can now more effectively test for resilience, you can simulate uh, ecological challenge where you put them into high temperatures or ocean acidic waters. It's really a game changer for what we can do to test these organisms that we're producing for more effective restoration in the future. This is amazing, it really is. Calling that a win. Absolutely. <laughs> There's a lot of work that went into these little guys. Yeah. <laughs> to get to this place today, it's taken us 15 years. We really can do this, and so I, I remain very, very hopeful. It's super important that we make really robust banks to conserve the genetics in as good a state as we can. This not only can work, but it can work in the kind of numbers that can be assistance for restoration. Jadi pertanyaannya adalah, apakah terumbu karang memiliki tangan atau lengan? Tentu saja mereka punya. Ini pertanyaan yang sangat menjebak ya. Para ilmuwan menggunakan sebuah alat atau teknologi yang disebut alat monitor terumbu karang otomatis atau lengan untuk memonitor kesehatan terumbu karang yang sebelumnya itu tidak sama sekali mungkin untuk dilakukan. Bayangkan. If you were going to measure the health of the ocean, how would you do it? Would you count fish? Would you count coral? Would you count crabs? This is an ARMS, or Autonomous Reef Monitoring Structure. An ARMS is a stack of PVC plates separated by spacers that function as prefabricated housing for marine creatures. Think of it as an underwater condo. Their structure is meant to mimic the nooks and crannies found in ocean habitats where the majority of species lives. Arms are placed on the seafloor for a set period of time. After a year or more, they are retrieved to see who moved in. Researchers take the arms apart, photograph the plates, and run everything through sieves to separate moving creatures into size fractions. Then, they scrape the plates into a blender so that the DNA can be analyzed all together. Arms are being deployed all around the world, from the equator to the poles, and from the intertidal down to 300 meters. Because arms are all made the same, you can compare marine communities between places or over time. Along the way, scientists are discovering a hidden world of diversity, and even new species. Arms can also be used to predict how species might adapt to changing ocean conditions like pollution or ocean acidification. We all know it's important to visit the doctor for a checkup. We need to do the same thing for the ocean. By combining simple materials with new technologies, arms help us to take the pulse of the planet.
Remember how I said the world needs innovators? Well, we're about to meet one. Dr. David Klein is a scientist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, where he has found some interesting ways to study coral reefs. Welcome, Dr. Klein. We are so pleased that you could join us from Panama. I'd like to start by asking you a very straightforward question. Why study coral reefs? Well, coral reefs are the most diverse ecosystems in the oceans. They're much like the rainforest on land. And along with this diversity, they're incredibly important to humans. So there are over 500 million people that are dependent on coral reefs for their livelihood. Coral reefs uh, protect the land from storms and cyclone damage. They, they provide, they're the source of many different drugs and they provide billions of dollars to economies around the world related to fisheries and tourism. So unfortunately, they're incredibly threatened throughout the world. So it's really important to study coral reefs to better understand how they work so that we can find new ways to protect and make sure they're healthy moving into the future. And my next question is, what tools do you use to protect coral reefs? Yeah, so I've been working on developing what I call conservation technologies. So basically technologies that have been developed in Silicon Valley by companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and Facebook, and use those technologies in a different way in order to improve the way that we study and conserve coral reefs. So one example is if you think about Facebook, in Facebook, there's a process called machine learning. And so in Facebook, when you tag the faces of your friends, after you tag enough of your friends' faces, after a while, you upload a photo of your friend and it'll suggest your friend's name. Using a similar machine learning system, we train the computer to recognize different species of corals and the dominant organisms on a reef. And after we train it, it can then identify these organisms at a rate up to 10,000 times faster than the human experts. So it's possible to get the data much faster in, in a matter of days rather than years. And then we're also using technologies developed for self-driving cars, for example, to develop low-cost robotics that can uh, survey reefs faster, deeper, um, and at greater scales. And our hope is that in the next five years or so, that there'll be swarms of these robots in the ocean that will be able to survey the world's coral reefs every year and be able to provide the data quickly enough to improve the management and conservation of coral reefs. That's amazing, Dr. Klein. I understand that Indonesia is the hotspot for coral diversity, that there are more species of coral in Indonesia than anywhere else on the planet. So it is a very special place. We have some questions that have come in from students in Indonesia who are participating in the U.S. Embassy English Access Program. Let's see what they have to ask you. Hi, my name is Salsa from Senior High School in Ternate, and I'm the participant of U.S. Embassy's English Access Micro Scholarship Program. So, I would like to know how you decided to study corals and what is the best part of your job? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, well, I grew up in California, really close to the beach. So I've been an ocean person my whole life. I think I learned to swim and surf before I could walk. So I've always had a strong connection with the, with the ocean. But when I went away to college, I ended up going to school in Minnesota, which is totally landlocked. And after four years in Minnesota, I, it was so clear to me how much I missed the ocean and so in my senior year of college, I was able to go to an off-campus program in Australia and New Zealand. And as part of this program, I got to do research on the Great Barrier Reef. And from the first minute I dropped off the boat onto the Great Barrier Reef, I looked around and was just amazed by the beauty and the magnificence of coral reefs. And I decided right then that I wanted to study coral reefs for my career. And I've been working on coral reefs ever since. And the second part of your question, what's the best part of my job? Honestly, every minute that I'm underwater, it's kind of my happiest place. So the best part of my job is the field work, being able to go diving on reefs, traveling the, um, to different parts of the world, interacting with people to study and protect coral reefs. That's really the highlight for me. So being underwater and working with people in different communities to find new ways to protect coral reefs. Hi, my name is Agustinus Alan Prajo 
from SMA Katolik Reksmundi Manado. I'm also an alumna of U.S. Embassy's English Access Micro Scholarship Program and Canada Luger Yes Program. I would like to know how we can help save the coral reefs. What can we do to make a difference here in Indonesia to save our local reef? Yes, so in order to save coral reefs, we need everyone to get involved. So that includes um, trying to do everything you can to reduce your environmental footprint. So recycling, um, trying to carpool, trying to use public transportation and bicycles as much as possible, but also take an active role in saving the ocean and the reefs around you. There are several programs um, that have been developed, many um, that the Smithsonian are involved with to try to get children and scientists from Indonesia, from Indonesia involved in protecting in Indonesia's reefs and better understanding Indonesian reefs. So I would encourage you to spend time in the water and get involved, get involved in activities to try to protect your oceans and your reefs, because that's the only way that we're going to have beautiful reefs for your children and your grandchildren. That's a great suggestion. Um, one final question for you, Dr. Klein. Are you optimistic about the future of coral reefs? Yeah, so one of the hardest parts of my job is seeing how seriously threatened coral reefs are around the world. But I have to say, over the last five years or so, I've become incredibly optimistic with the scale of efforts that are happening all around the world to try to change the way that we live our lives to try to protect our planet. And also in the marriage between science and um, communities and, and nonprofits to do everything we can together to try to save coral reefs and actually actively restore them. And as this develops throughout the world, I'm more convinced that we are going to have really beautiful, healthy reefs in the future. And, and I think we do um, have a great chance of having uh, healthy coral reefs if we all get involved. Terima kasih banyak, Dr. Klein. Sekarang mari kita pergi ke Belize untuk bertemu dengan ilmuwan Smithsonian Melanie McPhail. It was just amazing to me having um, learned to dive in South Carolina Lake. The reefs were, um, and then they still are, they're just amazing, full of colored life, all packed into a really tight spot. So you see this abundance and diversity of, of crazy color. It always reminded me of Dr. Seuss stories. My name is Melanie McField, and I'm the director of the Healthy Reefs for Healthy People Initiative with the Smithsonian Institution. The Mesoamerican reef is threatened by over-harvesting of marine life, by coastal development and pollution coming from sewage, coming from runoff, agriculture, and industrial development, and also global climate change. Maintaining the health of a coral reef is vital to the local communities. They depend largely on tourism and fishing. So what we have to do is learn how to manage those industries better and let them provide livelihoods without over-harvesting and over-developing and running the tourism in a more sustainable way. The partners in the Healthy Reef Initiative are a mixture of international and local NGOs, research institutions, and government agencies. Together, we come up with this collaborative voice that offers our best solutions based on the latest science. The model and the framework that we've developed in Healthy Reefs can be used in other coral reef areas around the world. Demikian episode pertama Earth Optimism hari ini. Apakah kalian sekarang lebih tahu banyak tentang terumbu karang? Earth Optimism percaya bahwa kita perlu menyebarluaskan informasi ini agar semakin banyak orang yang tahu dan semakin banyak yang bisa kita ikut untuk berpartisipasi menjaga terumbu karang. Jika kalian penasaran dan ingin belajar lebih lanjut, silakan cek www.earthoptimism.si.edu. Jangan lupa untuk menjadi Earth Optimist dan sampai jumpa di episode berikutnya.